Um, my name is Peter Kleinhens. I'm the conservation coordinator um, at Tall Timbers Research Station in Land Conservancy, and I am also the conservation chair of Appalachian Audubon Society. And I'll be moderating tonight's uh, panel on land conservation and birds here in Florida. And I am very um, privileged to be joined tonight by uh, three friends and colleagues in the conservation field. And um, I'm going to briefly introduce each one, and then I'm going to let each one tell us a little bit about them before we kind of launch into things. So for starters, we have uh, Dr. Susan Carr. Um, Susan works as the Strategic Conservation Manager at Alachua Conservation Trust based in Gainesville, Florida. She does all kinds of really excellent work um, involving uh, partnership programs, land conservation, assisting um, landowners in, in so many different ways, uh, Florida Forever projects, the list goes on and on. She also has her doctorate um, studying uh, plants in fire adapted pineland ecosystems and is a botany extraordinaire. Um, and she's also just a, a wonderful person and a wonderful human being and um, kind of a one of the people I like to think of, actually all these people, is kind of legends in the Florida conservation world. Um, so the next person uh, that joins us is Neil Fleckenstein. Neil is the Tall Timbers Planning Coordinator and his role for uh, 20 plus years at Tall Timbers has been to basically advocate for um, all sorts of different things that preserve the land conservation interests of Tall Timbers, uh, the right to continue to use prescribed fire, um, growth management issues, the list goes on and on. And Neil is, is exceedingly knowledgeable about growth management and planning issues, uh, both locally and around the state, and does a lot to, to ensure that the conservation that happens, uh, you know, is, is respected by all. Um, Neil is also a, a, a very knowledgeable person, especially about uh, the things that threaten our conservation lands, and so his expertise is going to be appreciated tonight for sure. Um, and then last but not least is Mr. Kent Wimmer. Uh, Kent Wimmer serves as the coordinator of the very newly, thanks to his efforts, uh, designated Northwest Florida Sentinel Landscape, and he also works as the senior Northwest Florida representative for Defenders of Wildlife. Um, he's been active in the conservation field for, for decades. Um, he is, he's done all sorts of things to improve recreation access on our local trails, um, Florida Trail Association, heavy involvement there. Um, he's even famous. He's, he's been featured uh, with Jeff Corwin on, on a television series, among other things. So um, these three people are absolutely incredible and do so much good work. And I think you're, you're really going to get a lot out of tonight's discussion. Uh, thanks to their expertise. So with that, uh, I would like each person to kind of uh, highlight basically how they are involved. I've given some overviews, but how are you involved with uh, land conservation here in Florida? And we'll start, we'll go backwards. We'll start with Kent. Hey folks, this is Kent Wimmer. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about conservation here in Florida and especially Northwest Florida. I've been working in conservation in Florida since the uh, early 90s, first with 1000 Friends of Florida. I was involved with planning the first greenway system throughout the state of Florida, followed that um, working in the Office of Greenways and Trails where we adopted the, the uh, first Florida Greenways and Trails plan statewide. Following there, I was uh, in charge of building and maintaining the Florida National Scenic Trail for the Florida Trail Association. And um, since, since I left FTA about, uh, about nine years ago, I worked for the Amendment 1, the Land and Water, um, or the Water and Land um, Conservation Amendment. And then for the last uh, almost nine years, actually nine years this week, I've been uh, I've been the, the senior Northwest Florida representative for Defenders of Wildlife. So a lot of my work is advocating for land acquisition, for um, planning. I'm a planner by trade, like Neil went to FSU and went to the uh, through through the Department of Urban Regional Planner Planning. I'm a environmental planner planner by trade. Uh, 
So anyway, I've been working on establishing a vision and working towards implementing this conservation vision of connected lands throughout Florida for a long time. So really glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Kent. Neil. Um, I'm kind of a lightweight compared to Susan and, and Kent, who've done some amazing work. Um, I've, uh, after I left graduate school, I spent 10 years in emergency management and um, I guess worked on a lot of things, worked on the planning for a lot of things that I hoped would never happen. And at some point I kind of realized that it'd be kind of cool to plan for things that I actually hoped would happen. So uh, I joined Tall Timbers uh, 21 years ago uh, next week and uh, basically started the land use planning and advocacy program there. And we had about 35,000 acres of land under conservation easement then. And I basically spent the last 21 years working to protect our conservation interests, uh, as Peter said, from uh, a wide range of, of things that could adversely affect those conservation interests, but also to protect kind of the, gen the landscape as a whole and the Red Hills just to buy us more time to get land protected and under conservation easement. And the longer I've been there, kind of the land, the, the, the scale of land that we're working on in terms of trying to protect uh, those landscapes has increased. And obviously, so has the uh, so has the threats. So as uh, as time has gone on, I guess the the range of issues I've worked on, uh, both legislatively as well as infrastructure and development, has kind of increased as well. So basically, when Peter and our team get land conserved, um, my goal is to try and make sure that those resources are are protected in any way that I can. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Susan. Oh hi, hi. I'm Susan, and. Uh... Wow, best intro ever. Thank you, Peter. Uh, <laughs> so I'm happy to be here. And um, I have been working. Well, I, I, I'm a reformed ecologist, I like to say. I, I, did, I do have a PhD in wildlife ecology and conservation. And that really kind of bred a, um, a, a interest in land conservation since for my PhD, I traveled around all these um, federal, I mean, uh, public lands and, and saw a lot of stuff. So um, I'm also a native Floridian, so I really am trying to save Florida now through more on the um, implementation end of it. So I work with program. I work a lot with landowners and try to match them up with conservation programs to achieve their conservation goals. Sometimes I like to think of myself as like the wedding planner, <laughs> trying to match them up or the matchmaker or something like that. So um, that's the ultimate goal, you know, to, to bring good conservation to the ground. And that also involves a lot of um, fundraising, grant writing, partnership building, and a lot of other things. I actually do a lot uh, of similar things that uh, uh, Peter does, but I'm over here in the Alachua Conservation Trust, the, the neighboring land trust to Tall Timbers. And we're, uh, we work in North Florida, sort of the North Peninsula part of Florida. So um, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Susan. Um, before I go into the next question, um, and I'm gonna ask, kind of start asking some individual questions um, along with some follow-ups, but before I do that, I just wanna say to all the participants that uh, please feel free to drop comments, questions, um, any thoughts you have in the chat, and I will try to periodically monitor that, monitor that and bring those in if relevant. Um, but we can also get to questions. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, with that, my next question is for Mr. Neil Fleckenstein. Neil, what do you think the main causes today for habitat conversion are? What are the biggest threats to, to our habitat? Uh, poorly planned and located uh, development. Um, you know, you keep hearing the statistic thousand people a day moving to Florida and, and that ranges, you know, quite a bit with uh, with COVID and things like that. But yeah, we're we're upwards of eight to nine hundred people a day that are moving to to the state. Now, a lot of them are moving into, you know, central Florida and south Florida, um, but we still get our fair share in our neck of the woods. And it it really is that kind of the development machine typically that's that's leading to the conversion and fragmentation of lands. Um, and then, of course, in the state of Florida despite the fact that we're growing so rapidly, we've basically dismantled the state growth management agency. So we no longer really have state oversight the way we used to have when there was a Department of Community Affairs. Now things really are down at the local level. And if you're lucky, you live in a community that does good planning work and it's it's easier to kind of conserve those, those rural landscapes. If you live in a county that 
really does not value long range planning, uh, you're going to see a tremendous amount of fragmentation. So the onus really now is on the the local counties, and then for folks like NGOs, like you know, like Tall Timbers and others, and for people to kind of get involved in those issues. But it's it's habitat conversion due to fragmentation from development. Got it. And as a quick follow up, um, for the Appalachian Audubon Service area, which you know ranges from like Franklin County over to Jefferson, are how do we? How are we situated in the grand scheme of Florida? Uh, really, really well off comparatively. Um, we're not dealing with the same kind of growth challenges they are in other parts of. We are we are so lucky. When I look at our map of conservation lands and the work that Kent uh, and others are doing, you know, we're we're miles ahead of other parts of the state of Florida. I do think we're going to start to see you know climate migrants that are kind of moving from other parts of Florida up to the higher higher and drier land in our neck of the woods. But we've got a great advantage in that we've got, you know, these large conserved Department of Defense lands, uh, the lands that Kent is working with on, uh, on his project. Um, we've got, you know, federal lands in terms of the Apalachicola National Forest, the St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge, the Osceola Wildlife Management Area, all of those lands to the to the south. And then we've got uh, tall timbers with the private conservation lands, you know, 175,000 acres of land that we've conserved there. And in the middle of all of that, You've got you know the fastest growing urban area, but they do have an urban service boundary that contains a lot of that growth. So we we're doing a lot of things right, and and frankly a lot better than other parts of the state. Awesome, thanks, Neil. Um, and by the way, if uh, other panelists, if someone else is answering and you have something to add, feel free to raise your hand. But um, my next hey, question, Peter, I do, yeah, I yeah. do. Um, one of the challenges we're also facing in Northwest Florida is climate change. We said it, climate change. Climate change is real. Humans are causing it. Humans are being impacted by it. Um, you have to, you know, we don't have to look any further back than October of 2018 when Hurricane Michael ripped through Tyndall Air Force Base, Panama City, and about 3,000, or 3 million acres of uh, pines that are ripped up through Bay County, Gulf County, Calhoun County, Liberty, into Gadsden County. I mean, heck, even here in Tallahassee, we felt the effects. I had a tree fall on my house. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sea level rise that's, that's causing a lot of coastal erosion, loss of beach, loss of nesting habitat for... Um, for, for uh, shorebirds, you know, nesting shorebirds along all of our um, sandy beaches, you know, that also impacts um, sea turtle impacts, you know, impacts nesting of sea turtles, um, you know, plus, you know, just with increased rainfall, we have more, we have, we have greater storm events that creates more sedimentation in our estuaries, so that's, you know, that's throwing off the oysters, that's covering up the places where sturgeon goes spawned. So, you know, we have a lot of dirt roads in Northwest Florida. And so when it rains hard, those dirt roads are washing right into our creeks and streams and down to our estuaries. You know, also, you know, increased temperatures, you know, we, you know, what it's weird, the weather's so weird. You know, it was like 36 last night here in Tallahassee. We're in the middle of March. It definitely should not be that cold, but we're definitely going to probably pay for it next week when it's in the 90s. So, you know, temperature variations is screwing up the animals. It's screwing up, you know, <laughs> sorry, I have a cough. It's um, anyway, it's, it's going to be messing with people for a long time. I mean, in, in 50 years, are your grandchildren going to want to live here because it's going to be so dang hot in the summer? And they, you know, the nights just don't cool down. The winters don't get cold. The chiggers and the ticks don't get wiped out with frost. You know, it, Florida's going to be a much different place. So anyway, that's my soapbox. Yeah. Sorry. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one thing I wanted to, to circle back on before we move to like how land is actually conserved is we talked about how this region is doing and either Susan or, or Neil, 
How does Florida rank in terms of what has been conserved compared to other states in the United States? Um, if you guys have a quick answer for that. Oh, uh, I can take several. Neil probably knows. So uh, for the southern states, so I think it's something about 25% of our land is in some form of conservation. And uh, I, gosh, I used to hear that a lot when there was battles about taking stuff out of the tax base and everything. That sounds like a lot. A lot of it is wet, big swamp. You think about the Everglades, big Cypress. A lot of it's underwater, Biscayne Bay, you know, big chunks like that. So if you really broke it down by uplands, it's going to be a lot smaller uh, percentage. Now, I've lived in other southeastern states, and we are lucky that we have so much conservation land. I used to live in Louisiana, and it's a very, very different. So compared to the deep south states, I think we are have a lot going on. now. Other maybe Neil knows more comparisons about with Western. Obviously, Western states there there's a lot of federal land, but go ahead, Neil. <laughs> yeah, the, the Western it's, it's a little bit apples and oranges because you yeah. the, in the Western states, you know, Nevada is about eighty five to eighty nine percent, you know, federally controlled. So we a little hard to kind of compare Eastern and Western U.S. I completely agree with with Susan that um, if you look at the Southeast. Relatively speaking, we're, we're doing better in terms of conservation land in Florida. Um, we I actually did a comparison last year because Tall Timbers works in Florida and Georgia, and our funding is far better in Florida for conservation than it is in Georgia. They're, they're trying to catch up, but um, it's really hard to compare the two. For every, at least last year, for every dollar for land conservation in Georgia, we had about $80 for land conservation in Florida. So we, we have more opportunity, but of course we also have enormous growth. So we need to have those dollars for conservation when we're growing at, at such a rapid clip. Right. Oh, and I'll just add, if you don't mind. So I, I had this map a while back, I don't have it now, but I did it, the, uh, the, the conservation lands in Florida, about half is in federal ownership and about half is state, it really is. So if you think about federal, we have, the Everglades, Big Cypress, three big national forests, Eglin Air Force Base, which is itself what half a million acres plus, you know. So those we have like these giant federally owned kind of hubs, and then uh, the state lands tend to be much smaller and more scattered. But when you hear that twenty five percent, that includes everything. I mean, uh, uh, university lands, uh, correct Department of Corrections. You know, it really, it really encompasses a lot. And another distinction I'd say, just because you, it says conservation lands doesn't mean there's a lot of multiple use activities going on out there, so. <laughs> and when when you all talk about, um, and this, is, I'd like, Susan, if you can kind of take this, this follow up. When you all talk about conservation funding from a federal and state perspective, like, just simply put, how does land get conserved? How does, at least when we're talking about conservation land, how does that even get into state ownership? What is What does that process or processes look like? Well, it's pretty varied. Um, I work a lot with the Farm Bill and Florida Forever. So the Farm Bill, believe it or not, the Farm Bill, what? You know, it's actually probably the biggest funder of conservation in, in the nation, okay? And it's not a perfect fit, but it, it's it's a good it's a good tool, and it funds uh, purchase. It it's only good for conservation easements, okay. And then the, on state programs, Florida Forever buys lands, fee lands, and conservation easements. Uh, there are several um, programs on the state level that that buy lands now. But I want to say, under all this, it's a willing seller system. So conservation lands start with a willing seller, period. So if, you, if you're trying to get private lands into conservation, it has to have some, you have to have somebody who wants to do this. And usually it's a mixture of they want to sell something and get some revenue, but they, have, they usually have some kind of connection or some will to get their land in conservation. That's what I've found. So it will really, it, it, so if you're trying to reach those people that, either are wholeheartedly or have a mixture of uh, intent to put their land in conservation, then it's a matter of how do you get to those people? How do you recognize them and engage them and everything? And that is a lot what land trusts do. Because, I mean, I won't speak it. I don't want to say too, but like in general, these big programs, they're not really doing a lot of focused outreach. 
for these programs, like especially the farm bill, because the farm bill is everything under the sun, right? I mean, it's like people who want to build irrigation systems and stuff like that. So I wouldn't say on that side, there's a lot of really targeted, um, you know, attention to just people who want to do conservation easements for conservation. However, the farm bill does have programs that actually engage people like us. And that's a lot of what we do. <laughs> nice. And um, so I'll, yeah, I'll Ken, add... I was going to go to you. I okay. was going to go to ne you next. I want to, I want to hear from you about kind of where, and with whatever you're saying, but I also, if you could touch on just where, when we talk about these programs like Florida Forever, Farm Bill, whatever, like where is that funding? Is it is it well funded? Is it could it be better? Where's that? Okay, yeah. So one one of the the fun tasks I have is uh, going before the Florida Acquisition and Restoration Council. It's appointed by the governor and their state agency heads. That this is a this is a citizen state body that basically approves projects on the Florida Forever list. So when all of you supported and voted for Amendment 1 in 2014, uh, probably everybody in this call voted for it if you were 18 by then. You know, it passed with 75% of the state's votes. So what that did is that actually set aside, Florida has a real estate transfer tax. So when that tax you know, when you buy a property, you sign a contract, there's a certain tax that goes into something called the, the land and water or the uh, land acquisition trust fund. That is a pot of money that the legislature every year appropriates funding to the Florida Forever program. The the, so this past two years, the legislature has appropriated $800 million to buy land which is an incredible amount. Now, 600, 600 million of it was from the feds, from the, um, the- COVID thing. The, the stimulus. The, the um, stimulus bill, the, the ARSA, ARC, whatever it's, the American Rescue Plan. So, you know, that, that money came from the rescue plan, but a hundred million dollars came to the Florida Forever. But the funny thing is, ever since 2015, when the money first started rolling in, the legislature hasn't been funding the third, the full 30% of the funding that's being directed from, from doc stamps to the Florida Forever program or to the Land Acquisition Trust Fund. They've been doling it out about $100 million at a time when this, when it's actually generating over a billion dollars every year. And so they're basically skimming the money off the top, spending it on a lot of stuff that's not related to land acquisition, management or restoration. And so even though Florida is doing great compared to almost every other state in the nation, we could be doing so much better in conserving our natural heritage than what we're doing right now. And it's because the legislature is misappropriating the funds for for how the how the voters, how you all intended for that money to be spent. So um so where am I supposed to go with this, Peter? That's that's good. No, that was good. I just I was curious about kind of where things rank and, and a follow-up question I had for for Mr. Neal is that you know, regardless of where this funding comes in land is being conserved. It's being conserved with private and, and public conservation. In terms of public conservation, you know, putting land into WMA, state parks, whatever, isn't that taking, you know, isn't that uh, taking up a lot, of, a lot of land that could be developed and, and benefiting, you know, local economies? What, what are the benefits um, of doing that kind of land conservation? I mean, there are obviously there are enormous benefits from public land protection as well as private land protection. And, and I, I would not underestimate the importance of private land protection. I think, I don't have the, the latest numbers off the top of my head, but at one point there was about 40 million acres that had been protected nationwide through conservation easements, which was a, equivalent to about the same amount of land that we have in, um, in US national parks um, in, the, in the contiguous 48 states. 
So private land conservation is enormous, enormously important. Um, in terms of the uh, the public lands and couldn't that be used for other uses? Obviously it, it could be, uh, but when you're looking at the highest and best use of these lands, a lot of the lands, as Susan said, um, may not be appropriate for development. We've got a lot of a lot of low lying areas in both coastal and inland areas. Um, we have in the past tried to drain and fill those lands. That does not work. Mother Nature is going to take it back, and I don't know how many how much how many billions of dollars we've wasted on that. So you know we've had a lot of great efforts at conserving those lands, which are just vital in terms of aquifer recharge and protection of water resources in those public spaces. And Frank, again, those lands shouldn't be developed in the first place. So the more conservation, the better on those. But obviously, we need to protect you know some upland areas as well. Now, you know, one of the things we've said at Tall Timbers forever is we need to have places for people and places for wildlife. We we recognize there's a lot of people moving into the state, um, and we have to work with our friends across the aisle, right? Not everybody kind of has the same conservation perspective we do. So it's kind of a matter of trying to figure out where can we get the biggest bang for our buck on those public conservation lands. So something like the Florida Wildlife Corridor is a is a good way to approach it, where we're kind of identifying where can we get the biggest bang for our conservation buck on those upland areas and those wetland areas around the state, as opposed to having more of a, a scattershot approach. I don't know if that's getting at what you're asking, Peter, but that's perfect. And and I think you're you're bringing up private and public conservation land is really important as well. And the fact that you brought up the corridor is perfect because my next question for Susan is we've heard so much about the wildlife corridor you know it's it's all over the news it's what everybody's talking about in in the conservation world here in florida um kind of two questions in this one is you know how important to neil's point is private and public conservation to achieving this wildlife corridor and and along with that how important is it that groups like alachua conservation trust tall timbers you know, uh, Sentinel landscapes are, are intermeshing. Can you talk about that kind of partnership piece of achieving those goals? Uh, sure, <laughs> the big topic. So last I heard, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, to build the, so the Florida Wildlife Corridor, y'all probably seen a map, is is a concept. It, it's a blueprint. Okay, we got it. Okay. Um, whoa, okay. All right. So bits of those are. Okay. Sure. So. So Susan, this, this is the Florida Wildlife Corridor in Northwest Florida. Yeah. On the background of the Northwest Florida Sentinel landscape. Right. So okay. the wildlife corridor is in pink. Okay. So you or see that purple. pink area is a lot. And that pink area is not conservation land. It's it's part of this blueprint. You know, it's an idea, it's a concept, but I mean it's more than an idea. It's like a scientifically based map, you know, to 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 guide conservation. But the last I heard to build the whole thing statewide is like 18 million acres. It's a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just uh, think big and everything. So how are you going to conserve or even get close to 18 million acres with everything you got? And so that that's like, you know, that can be the more traditional buy it, hold it, manage it and everything. But it's going to have to be a lot more than than that because dollars only go so far. So. One argument in favor of conservation easements is that they typically cost less and they keep the land actually in private ownership, right? So your buck goes further. But then uh, we're going to have to do a lot of other things too, even beyond the, you know, buying things and locking or not, you know, buying conservation easements or that kind of thing. They'll have to be, uh, you know, payment for ecological services is like another big, you know, forefront of this. So to try to compensate private landowners, not by buying a conservation easement necessarily, but compensate them for doing something good for conservation. Carbon credits, um, conservation banks for, or endangered species kind of banks. So these kind of programs, which I'd say we're, you know, I feel like we're just kind of on the forefront of these. So incentive programs that use, uh, you know, that are private, or what do you call it, um, market-based um, programs. So, oh, what was the rest? Oh, the how-to partnerships and all that stuff. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> partnerships are, I think are huge for, I was like, adopt a piece of the corridor, make a partnership and go, right? 
because it brings benefits not only of the collaboration of many different, you know, agency folks or, or technical expertise. Um, it's also good to attract funding, right? And it's good, and because, you know, Peter and I very much live in the grants world, if you're gonna write a big grant, you have to match it with another big grant or something, right? So there's all this match, uh, I guess, momentum or, or critical mass that builds and partnerships are really good at that. So they're good for attracting funding, attracting or building, you know, you can take a chunk of the corridor, but you still have to bring it down to the next level and plan how are you gonna do that identifying willing sellers or willing participants. So, so the corridor is kind of thinking on a big scale, but it still needs to be built and implemented on a regional scale. So regional, regional, regional. And partnerships are great at a regional scale, like the area that we're talking about now. You know, obviously Tall Timbers has taken this on. You know, they drew a map and they made a story and a plan and, and all this stuff. And there you go. <laughs> They've done great work, largely based on um, partnerships. Excellent. That was an excellent answer, Susan. Thanks Thank for you. biting off that large question. Um, <laughs> I do have, I do have a, a follow up um, on something you said that I'd like Neil to, to address. And mm -hmm. that is, um, Susan mentioned this word, and we've heard it a few times, conservation easement. What is just a simple layperson definition of, of conservation easement for our audience? Conservation easement is when a landowner works with either a governmental entity or a land trust, a nonprofit land trust like uh, uh, the Electoral Conservancy or Tall Timbers, and the landowner uh, forever agrees to um, restrict development rights on their property. They basically give away uh, the development rights on their property. Uh, they can either donate them or they can be purchased uh, with, the, with the conservation easement, but they do that in perpetuity. So you're agreeing in perpetuity that you will not largely not develop a piece of of property and that is uh, perpetuity as we say is is a long time um those conservation easements run with the land so once an easement is placed on that property you can sell it but the easement stays it remains on that property so we've got projects at tall timbers now that are you know coming close to 45 years of protection on those on those lands they've transacted numerous times but that easement perpetually stays with the property. In our experience, we do a lot of donated conservation easements where the landowners are getting a tax break, a federal tax break for doing it, but there also are purchase of, of conservation easements where the landowner is, is getting a sort of pennies on the dollar to uh, forever give away the development rights on, on that piece of real estate. Excellent. And um, I know that one of the things with, with private land conservation that's touted as a benefit is that um, you know, if private landowners are holding the land, they're paying for the management costs. And I know that land management is really important too. Kent, could you talk a little bit about how land management fits into the concert land conservation picture and, and how the public and private um, management of those lands, you know, matters? Sure. Um, you can have your backyard and if you don't mow it, you don't take care of it, it grows up. It could be growing up in invasive species. It could be growing up on non-native species. So, but how does that help wildlife? How does that help the birds if you have species out there that they can't feed and nest on and, you know, survive? So, you know, you, you can have the prettiest land out there but if it's not managed and in Northwest Florida, if it's not burned with prescribed fire, you will lose the habitat value of that land. It will gradually shift into a different ecosystem or eco, different ecotype that is no longer probably compatible with, with the original species that were found here. So, um, <coughs> You know, that's that's why, you know, on a winter day, you might see a smoky haze whiffing into the city of Tallahassee because they're doing prescribed burns or even the north side from from tall timbers. They're doing prescribed burns out there because what they're trying to do is is establish the natural community 
that was here before we built roads and highways and railroads and housing developments and utility lines that completely fragmented our, our, this, this area. Fires used to sweep across the landscape and they would burn months at a time. And so they had generally a, a frequent uh, return interval of two to three years. And that's what kept our, our forest healthy. A healthy forest that, you know, when Burnham rode his, his wagon through, he was talking about riding a wagon through a grassland with an open canopied forest. So that tells us if, if you don't have a grassland that's low cover, that's been regularly burned, you're not going to have the type of ecosystem that, that the plants and animals that have been living here for hundreds of thousands and millions of years, you know, this, you're not going to be providing them with the right habitat. So you could have the greatest forest out there, but if it's completely overrun, a thicket, and it's not burned, you're not going to have the, uh, the biodiversity of the species there that should be there in that habitat and that's yeah and that's spot on kent and susan i can, an, I can answer oh, yeah, that question ahead. that mr christman uh mr kevin christman answered yeah go his for question it. was regarding conservation easements how do you make sure the land owners also manage their lands correctly um which is a fabulous question so and i'm, I'm sure susan has a very similar answer to mine Whenever we work with a landowner on a conservation easement, we have a conservation management plan. Um, and we sit down with the landowners and talk about, you know, what kinds of, of management their properties need for it to be a healthy ecosystem. So we will, as Kent just alluded to, we will talk about the, the return interval for prescribed fire and build that into the management plan that it has to be, you know, burned. We have very strict limitations on, you know, the development on that property everything down to kind of the herbicide use, et cetera. And then we work very closely with those landowners to make sure that they're implementing those measures to ensure the, the protection of those natural resources on the property. We have, at a minimum, we're, out, we're on their property once a year, but the reality is we touch our landowners a lot more than that in terms of stewardship visits to help them with, you know, with invasive issues, timber cuts, et cetera. So we will be on a property three or four or five times a year and work in collaboration with our landowners to make sure they're, that they're doing really good land management. And on that note, um, Susan, I know you're really active with some management programs. I'm curious, you know, I, let's say I'm a landowner and I don't have a conservation easement, but, and I, and I might not be in a position to do a conservation easement or, or sell my land to the state or something, but I'm interested in birds. I've heard Bachman sparrows nearby and I have 30 acres of woodland that could be burned. What, what could I tap into or do to benefit the birds on my property here in Florida? Uh, you mean, and, but they, okay, just a small acreage, but no conservation easement. I, I just a regular with. old landowner with some property that wants to help out their birds with land management. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, if they're looking for technical assistance, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about over my my area. Of course, the land trust. I think the land trust and Tall Timbers is a great example of this. Are expanding services, so almost becoming sort of a one-stop shop for people like this. And this is the kind of person that maybe they're too small, or man, you also kind of get too small to really qualify for a lot of conservation easement purchase programs and that sort of thing. But they want to do good stuff, right? So land trusts now are we have technical expertise. We have people that uh, burn land or advise landowners on how to burn the land or how to do a management plan or even how to go out and find contractors and that kind of thing. So it's that kind of regional, you know, uh, uh, collaboration or expertise. On the financial side, if a landowner needs money to manage in this manner, we work a lot with cost share programs. And then I'm gonna go back to the farm bill again, believe it or not, there are a lot of, uh, when I say cost share programs, the federal government, if you get into a program and you do a bunch of management like you agree with them to do, 
they'll they'll uh, offset the expenses. So we work with a lot with that on the federal government and state government um, sides. And then the last thing for Alachua Conservation Trust, I think Tall Timbers has something similar. We uh, we work with landowner cooperatives. And there's one, the big one we have is North Florida Prescribed Burn Association. So again, this is more for fire management, but there are landowner cooperatives where landowners just get together and help each other <laughs> in this um, cooperative uh, system, just like I guess corn farmers were in the Midwest do or something like that. So I think there's also a similar landowner cooperative over in y'all's area. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times land trusts get involved with that. Uh, they may provide equipment, technical expertise, actual bodies to do the burning and so forth. So um, I, I kind of think that the North Florida Land Trust are really branching out more into this landowner assistance for management kind of arena. Um, and that, yeah, excellent. And Ken, um, I've got a, a couple more questions before we uh, yeah. take questions from the audience. And I'm going to kind of transition this discussion, which has been great. Thank you, guys. Um, to birds, because that's okay. that's what most of us care about. When when we talk about um, you know birds in particular, you know obviously okay. there's there's migration, there's stopover sites, there's breeding habitat, there's all these things. I guess how do birds rank on the scale of of conservation importance, and how are the things we're talking about, private, public, land management, I guess, can you help us kind of take in this discussion and narrow it down uh, to birds? Like how, how are birds helped by what we're talking about? The, the priority for, for the regulatory agencies, and if we're talking about how do we protect existing habitat that, that, that the birds and other critters use, it starts with the Endangered Species Act. So the Endangered Species Act identifies either species that, that are on their way to extinction or that are moving that direction but aren't at the premises yet. And so that that's really provides a good focus for, for those species, especially the shorebirds on our coast where they're influenced by, you know, the wave height, you know, how, how many storms we have, the kind of weather we're having, how much development and light is polluting, is polluting the, uh, you know, is polluting the beaches behind them. And so the Endangered Species Act helps regulators and landowners focus on those species that first need protected. If we don't protect them, they're going to go away. The threatened species are those species that if we don't take some kind of action, they're going to protect their habitat. They're, they're going to move on to the endangered species list. And so um, I, I think is that, I'm, I'm not sure, Peter, help, help me yeah, out. So that, there's more that than I, was, I was just curious so, about, kind of, you know, birds, birds as kind of like the proverbial canary in the coal mine, like, you know, clearly they use so many different habitats. Like how does this, you know, are they especially well, well suited yeah, to be benefited well, from land conservation? It is, especially because the state has very sophisticated planning tools and identification tools where they have identified specific habitats that, <clears throat> excuse me, and specific areas where these habitats all throughout the state. And they put this in a geographic information system, which is a computerized mapping system. And they use those layers where these species, you know, migrate, nest, raise their young, you know, all the different life cycle life stages throughout, they identify, and it's for all different kinds of species, just not birds, and then they identify which of those habitats have essentially the most overlays on top of them, and that is how that influences projects that gets put on the Florida Forever list, or actually, you know, a project can get on a Florida Forever list, like Susan was saying, you have to have a willing, motivated landowner. If you have someone that says, yeah, I'm willing to, 
negotiate with the state for the sale of my land. Well, if it's in my backyard, the state's not going to be interested because I don't have any interesting species in my backyard other than my dog. You know, but if it's someone's yard, someone's back property, they're 900 acres, 3,000 acres, 50,000 acres that have the, the, the great habitat, those, those, those areas are going to get ranked much higher on the list. And so that's going to make, that sets a priority for where the state is going to work with those landowners to get those lands acquired and protected first. It is very much driven by, by the resource consider the habitat, the water, the the sure. species, you know. So that is very our 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 land acquisition programs are actually very scientific and science based. It's it's not political anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no that lands get picked. That's a perfect answer that that birds are birds are clearly one of the influencing factors for for prioritizing this conservation. And before we open it up to general questions, I, I've got a question for for Neil and possibly Susan too. on that note, um, you know, birds being great to kind of lift up these projects, the opportunities for public input. How can groups like Appalachia Audubon, the birding community at large here in Florida help, I guess, do we support or prop up these projects, private or public, um, from these programs to get funded and, and get conserved? What what can people do? Neil, maybe start with you. So I, I guess I'm going to deviate slightly from the question, and you can you can smack me at work tomorrow from from doing that. One of the most important things that that the public can do, frankly, is to uh, get involved locally in terms of decision making. Um, from, from the election perspective, all the way through the development perspective, we lose so much habitat, so much species habitat, which obviously affects you know, birds and critters as well. Um, so kind of finding out um, what the perspective is of all the local elected officials in your county and just really grilling them on what their perspective is on, on growth and development issues, and then kind of holding them to their feet to the fire on those issues. Um, you know, we, I think the, the, really we have a great opportunity here because we do have kind of a, an, an elected official base that is very close to the, to the public so we do have a great opportunity to kind of you know hold their feet to the fire uh in that regard uh in terms of the conservation projects you know the the uh the arc the acquisition restoration council at dep that is an open process so the public can come in and can comment you know on those projects um and and that's actually very, very crucial. You know, the, the ARC committee rec rec recognizes when they have a consultant who's working on the project, but I think it's very different when we actually have members of the public who are showing up to uh, to champion a particular project, not someone who's being paid, nothing wrong with that, but not something that's someone that's being paid, but actually having members of the public like Appalachia Audubon, et cetera, really championing a local project for whatever reasons, for protecting this kind of habitat, bird habitat, et cetera. So, so two things, you can champion those conservation projects, but uh, please, dear God, get involved at the local level um, and start electing elected officials who, you know, will be held accountable for making smart growth decisions. And, and, and I'll add to Neil, you know, I, I go testify before the Acquisition Restoration Council all the time. It's wonderful when Audubon shows up and they show up regularly supporting important ha bird habitat areas. And so, um, you know, you, you guys, Audubon does a really great job. I mean, I understand you folks even contributed to help buying an island out there in Appalachie Bay that's now part of the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. I mean, you, die, you guys are doing great work and you're doing it all over the state. And, um, but you have to be involved, you know? It's the old, the old saying, think, oh, Think globally, act locally, that's it. Awesome. Susan, before we open it up to general questions, um, yeah. you have a perspective on that. Oh, just how people can help? Well, actually, I mean, these are great ideas, advocacy and, and local uh, you know, politics and all that stuff. I'll just add, um, how do I? Okay, land con remember land conservation in is very much a willing seller, willing participant system. So if you know of people, you can help us actually identify 
important lands and important landowners, right? And maybe put us in touch with them or or whoever your local people are, <laughs> you know, land trust or whatever. So we don't know everything. I mean, we we love taking in leads or connections or referrals. Um, Peter's give me a lot. I give Peter a lot, you know, but we we just take a, it's, it's really kind of a word of mouth system. So if you, if you know of places or if you want to champion a, if you, if you get online and look at the maps of where the Florida Forever Project areas are, or, you know, other focal areas, and you know something that's an important bird habitat or something, then, then, you know, champion that. Um, I mean, citizens advocacy does kind of go a long way, especially at the local and regional levels. Um, look at whatever happened, that thing down in Pinellas County lately. I'm, I don't, well, you know, let's stop there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a really, really good point, Susan. And I, I think that illustrates, again, the partnership, the fact that, you know, people are always swapping these projects and, um, and kind of working together to achieve these goals. I put, just as a note, um, I know a lot of people aren't familiar with where these projects live when we talk about Florida Forever projects. I put a link in the chat and you can use that to go through details on every Florida Forever project uh, currently in, um, uh, in consideration for acquisition. So um, to respect everyone's time, because um, I, I do want to end as close to eight as possible. Maybe we can go a little long if we've got some really good questions. But um, I know there's there's a lot of folks, a lot of perspectives on, on this uh, meeting. Um, whether you want to ask, I think we have a small enough group. Um, you can probably just use the raise hand function or, or um, maybe even unmute yourself if that's allowable and ask questions. But um, while you have them, I really encourage you guys to ask any questions you have of, of the three panelists. Um, while they're here. So any questions? Peter, there is a, uh, Peter, there is a question in uh, the chat about hurricanes and insurance companies. Oh, okay, great. I'd, um, I'd, start with I'd, that. I'd, I'd, I'd be wanting to take a shot at it. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Insurance companies by their very nature are reactive. They are basing what their rates are based on past claims and what they project those claims to be in the future. I think what insurance, I think what we can do is help the insurance companies by building and developing our communities in a much more sustainable manner. So they're not impacted, they're not destroyed by hurricanes. We're building them in the wrong, we're building them in the right places we're staying out of the wrong places. Um, I think that's the first thing that that what that we can do is really encourage our communities to not build and then to actually remove development that's in harm's way. That's one thing the state of Florida has done great over the last 40 years is buying up riverine floodplains. You know, with all the water management districts, you know, they're with mostly bought, a, it's really hard to buy land on a river, anymore, you know, because so much of that lands in public ownership. Well, that is because we are preventing flood damage by having that land and protecting that natural floodplain. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's, I mean, the, the best thing that we can do is to um, build in the right place and because you know the insurance company is just reacting, and and what we could do is have the insurance companies better price where where there's going to be severe risk and not and less risk rather than spreading it all over. So you know the people in Tallahassee should be being paying the same hurricane risk as people do down on Cape San Blas. I mean. That's the, you know, the people that are, that are bearing the, that are bearing the burden should be paying for it. Thanks, Ken, for the answer. Um, other, other questions, feel free, you all should be able to unmute yourselves. If anyone has a question, go ahead and, and ask.
Hi there. This is Leah. I actually am the one that asked the question regarding the insurance claims, and I want to be more specific about my question. It was regarding how we can currently have more of an impact when working on these claims as they're coming in, being filed, insurance companies are not paying out. I get the theoretical and the wish list for how we should approach in the future, but I'm talking about how we handle when we are in an emergency crisis and we are working to help homeowners, property owners, landowners against assurance companies not wanting to pay out damage um, to current claims. Just a, a big, broad question for the panel. Thank you all. Boy, that's, that, that's a really tough one. I think we'd have to probably change, change our legislature to be more consumer friendly because we do not have that right now. They're, they're passing laws that it makes it almost impossible for consumers to uh, sue insurance companies to get a favorable settlement. So uh, we need different elected officials <laughs> essentially to establish different rules for the insurance companies. Um, and, and Leah, if, if you, um, we can, we can maybe circle back to that too. I know that's, that's kind of a tough one to, to potentially tackle, but Kevin, I see Kevin Christman um, with his hand raised. Kevin, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, great discussion. Thanks for taking the question. Um, my question is, is there, for all of the programs in place to purchase and help uh, not only conserve nonprofit lands, state lands, but specifically for private um, owners of the conservation easements, how does different agencies go in and rate those lands? Is there a set criteria? Is there a list of species present? Is it uh, because even anybody with 100 acres or 10 acres or hundreds, it's fantastic. Get all of it in conservation lands. Uh, but obviously thinking forward, if there's a, nothing but, you know, 20 acres of Brazilian pepper, you can clear that and restore it with some native planting projects and be fantastic if the neighboring habitat is also amazing, um, depending on where they are in the state. It could be a crucial little link in that conservation chain. So is there a criteria in place based on the state or is it by whoever's purchasing land and helping it? How does that all work? Yeah, so if it's, uh, if it's a, a project, um, maybe that's up for consideration for Florida Forever or for Department of Agriculture's Rural and Family Lands programs, they both have very well established, very rigorous criteria to evaluate the conservation values associated with that property. They've got enormous data sets that they've you know gathered that they'll evaluate each individual parcel that is that uh, that a, an owner is applying for to get conservation funding from the state on the private side um like a tall timbers and a number of other organizations too we have a land conservation prioritization tool and we've we've incorporated some of the criteria from the state but we've really tailored that to uh, our specific geographic region. So what are the criteria that we're most concerned about ecologically? And we will evaluate <laughs> each individual parcel uh, in that manner. So yeah, we're not we're not as you know crazy about getting 20 acres of Brazilian pepper to use your example. <laughs> but if we can fill in a conservation gap and it's and they've got you know great native habitat, et, et cetera, then that's gonna that's gonna score pretty high for us. So it, it's a it's a pretty rigorous process. And Susan, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna let you chime in because I know. Oh, you. just, I just want to make one point in that um, programs are very different in their priorities and their selection criteria. So here's two right on the state that I think are highlights. So Florida Forever is is mainly a, it's very much geography and natural areas, right? That's kind of the roughly uh, that is the kind of site. Not site. I mean, that would be a high priority land for acquisition. Um, rural and Family uh, Protection Program, which is through the Department of Agriculture, is for working lands. So more and more you're going to be seeing, or, or there are, I think, um, easement programs, conservation easement programs that are targeting working land, okay? Not, you know, restorable natural areas, all that stuff, but working land. So in productive land uses, grazing, timber, and stuff, and furthermore, the intent is that they stay in productive land uses. And we work a lot with these programs. I, I think we feel that working lands are important, right? But it's very, it's very different. And I explain this to landowners a lot. And then on the federal side, 
mostly those are for agricultural lands as well. So it really depends on the program. A lot of this is is what the priorities are. Yeah. And and I think, you know, Kevin, just to just to add one more thing um, I, to, to this discussion, we I think the the thought oftentimes is get it saved and then, you know, restoration. Um, that's that's I think probably the perspective that all all of these panelists at least have. But but that is a really good point and a good question. I for time's sake, um, I saw something else come in the chat. Yeah, I, oh, I, I great. was I was I was putting a link in perfect to to Florida Natural Areas inventory that lists the layers. Now, you know, obviously, a bigger project is going to have more resources and it's going to be easier even if it doesn't have the best resources, but there are some specific areas that you have to protect that habitat. Like the, you have to protect the mouth of a cave if you're going to protect this bat from going extinct, you know, or disappearing. So there are some areas that are postage stamp size that they're gonna protect just because of the specific habitat for maybe the species and that's some of the only place they live anywhere. And but there's others that, you know, we're go they'll they'll go buy fifty thousand acres of of um, flatwoods prairies down or you know um, prairies down in central Florida. You know, it may you know just for the scale and the linking of the whole habitat for the Florida Ecological Greenways Network, which is now the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So yeah. it, it it really depends how a, how that piece fits into the big puzzle and what that little piece has to offer. That's that that's if you can line those up, you can make the dollars flow and you can do the acquisition. If you have a willing landowner. <laughs> yeah. Those are and those are all those are all, have all been really good questions. I um I think for time's sake, uh, we probably should wrap this up. Before we do, I just want to say one thank you all uh, in the audience for participating. This will be recorded. Um, so please, if, if there's things you want to revisit, uh, visit our YouTube page where all of our programs are posted. Thanks to uh, Kathleen Carr, who's on this. Um, so please share with your friends um, if you think they'd be interested and just thank you for, for participating. But before we go, most of all, thank you to the panelists. These are three of the busiest people that I probably know, and yet they volunteered their time to be here for an hour today, hour plus. And so I just want to say I really appreciate it. And um, please, if, if, and if you guys want before you leave, feel free, like Kent just did, to put your email in there and maybe people can follow up with some additional questions if they have them. Um, but